John and Elizabeth Calvert were last seen on March 3rd of 2008 at 5.30 p.m. on South Carolina's Hilton Head Island, where they lived part-time on their 40-foot yacht, the Yellow Jacket. John owned four businesses on the island, including one that operated Harbor Town Marina, where the yacht was docked. The couple also lived part-time in the Brookhaven neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia, where Elizabeth was an attorney with the Hunter McLean Law Firm in nearby Savannah. Both prominent members of their community, it was very unlike the pair to just up and leave, and they kept in close contact with friends and family. So after they missed business appointments the following day, March 4th, they were reported as missing. Their cell phones and PDA devices have also been turned off since their disappearance, another fact highly uncharacteristic of the pair. Elizabeth's small single-engine plane, for which she obtained a pilot's license in 2006, has sat undisturbed on the tarmac of the island's airport. Their three cars have all since been located also, including a silver 2006 Mercedes E320 that initially could not be located, but was later found in the parking lot of the Palmetto Dunes Resort's Marriott Hotel, six miles from the marina. But none of the vehicles or airplanes seem to have clues as to the couple's whereabouts. Dennis Ray Gerwing was the chief financial officer of the club group, a realty group that manages Hilton Head Island properties, whom John had hired to do administrative, accounting, and other services for his commercial properties. Gerwing was the last person known to have seen the Calverts and refused to cooperate with police. John had ended his business relationship with Gerwing's group in 2007, and Gerwing was leading the transfer of services. Several days after the couple's disappearance, police issued a search warrant on Gerwing's home, office, and two of his vehicles. On March 10th, several hours before he was to be publicly named as a person of interest in the Calvert's disappearance, Gerwing's body was found in the bathroom of his condominium by his lawyer, where he had slashed his own neck, forearm, and inner thigh with a steak knife. He left two barely legible, not lucid suicide notes, admitting he had stolen money from the Calvert's businesses, but stopped short of saying he was involved in their disappearances. After his death, the club group was then audited and it was discovered he had indeed embezzled $2.1 million from the Calvert's company and seven other companies, depositing the money in a secret account. Elizabeth and John had allegedly discovered this and planned to confront him in their meeting with him on the day of their disappearance. When investigators searched Gerwing's home, they found the holster for his 22 caliber Beretta pistol, but not the gun itself. It's also known he purchased latex gloves and three large heavyweight drop cloths after his March 3rd meeting with the couple. John and Elizabeth Calvert's bodies have never been found, but they were declared legally dead in November of 2009. Gerwing is considered the prime suspect in their disappearances, and foul play is suspected. Braden Fuchsa was a 22-year-old man living in Olathe, Kansas. He worked as a security officer at Bass Pro Shop and due to financial hardship decided to steal around $1,000 from his employer. After being caught the next day, he returned most of the money with the hopes that he wouldn't face any charges but was ultimately arrested and set to appear in court on July 16, 2009 for his actions. After spending a day in jail, he visited his girlfriend on July 14th and spent the night with her. The next day, he gathered some of his belongings from his parents' house, ultimately leaving town. Prior to his departure, he also left his girlfriend Megan a cryptic message telling her goodbye. It was also around this time that he withdrew $800 from his parents' bank account and was unable to be reached by them the following day. The last confirmed sighting of Braden was on July 16th when he had his tire repaired by a serviceman. By this time, he had already driven through the night and according to the service provider, Braden claimed he was on his way to Billings, Montana. Unfortunately, it seems he never made the drive because his car was tagged and abandoned only an hour further down the road by a state police officer later that day. On July 19th, he was reported missing by his parents and his truck was found. Braden was known to have his boots, 
a 9mm Beretta gun owned by his parents, his medication, and his cell phone which had been turned off in his possession when he left the vehicle. He left behind valuables such as his laptop, his wallet, and warm clothing crucial to surviving exposure if he had chosen to brave the elements in an effort to disappear. The only non-verified sighting on Braden since his disappearance was from a soup kitchen worker for Salvation Army. Linda Curl reported that she had seen him on several occasions and that he didn't look homeless or malnourished. Although police could never confirm the sightings or locate the man she believed to be him, Linda did turn over a receipt with a signature, with handwriting that Brayden's mom believed to match his own. Unfortunately, Brayden's family got the news in May 2015 that his decomposed body had been discovered at the foot of Casper Mountain in Casper, Wyoming, approximately 70 miles from where his truck had been abandoned. All of the confirmed belongings that he had taken with him were found, and the cause of death was an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. One final thought on the case. It isn't uncommon for people to suddenly leave society, even if they come from a family that could support them should they fall on hardship. In Japan, it is so common that there is even a term for it. The evaporated people. Those that choose to live off-grid in an attempt to run away from failure of their job, marriage, or a mounting debt, hoping to do so in an effort to shed their former identities. It is estimated that nearly 100,000 cases occur in Japan each year, but it isn't hard to surmise that Braden may have taken a similar path given his love for outdoors and the preparations he took prior to leaving his home. Christy Cornwell was 38 years old when she was last seen walking along a road in northern Georgia on the night of August 11, 2009. Not much was known of her disappearance until April of 2011 when investigators were led to the home of 42-year-old James Scott Carringer, who was suspected of rape in Gilmer County, Georgia. Carringer killed himself as police tried to arrest him on the rape charges. He owned a silver Nissan Xterra and was from Brasstown, North Carolina, not far from Ranger, North Carolina, where a woman was attacked on December of 2009 by a man driving that same vehicle. Investigators believe Cornwell's disappearance to be related to this incident, but have not specified why they believe the two cases to be linked. A year and a half after her disappearance, investigators were led to a site in Union County, northern Georgia via Christie's cell phone records, which indicated that she had been nearby the night of her disappearance. And her brother, acting off a tip from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, found her remains there, in a wooded area about nine miles from where she was last seen. Despite the pain of now knowing for sure that her daughter is gone, Christie's mom was happy to be able to finally bring her daughter home, saying, I know in my heart she's in heaven and will see her again. Because there is no direct evidence against Carringer, the GBI says the case will remain an open and active investigation as they pursue investigative leads relating to him. We believe he was a career criminal and we do not know how much harm he has done, said GBI Director Vernon Keenan. On the one-year anniversary of Christie's disappearance, the GBI said it had conducted interviews at 450 houses in the Union County area, and the file in the case had grown to 40 volumes. April Beth Pitzer moved to California from Arkansas after ending her marriage with her husband and left her two children behind. Upon arriving in Newberry Springs, California, she told her mother that she had found work as a waitress, but several months later admitted that that hadn't been the case. In addition to being homeless, she also told her mom that she had not been taking her medication to treat her bipolar disorder, but had hopes that she would soon find a job in order to get back on her feet. 
This would come to fruition when she took a job as a caregiver in Newberry Springs and began to get her life back on track. Excited with her progress and finally being in a position of stability, April planned on returning home to see the two young daughters that she surely missed. She had apparently had a conversation with her roommate about going to see her family in Arkansas and claiming that she'd be traveling by bus. But it also seemed that she told some people that she would be taking a trip, while others described their conversation as her admitting that she was moving back home permanently. April was last seen in Newberry Springs on June 28, 2004, on the 30,000th block of Caspian Way. It is reported that she had been picked up by a friend and dropped off at the bus station, but she never made it home. After being contacted by her mother, on July 16th, a friend reported her missing, and it is still unclear if she ever got on the bus at all. Eight months later, after she was reported missing, someone in New Mexico tried to open a cell phone contract in her name. Authorities appeared to have reasonable doubts about this being any type of substantial lead. April's mother, Gloria, believed that she had been murdered by a drug dealer or someone affiliated with one. She believed the person left her body in an abandoned mine. Gloria has been an active participant in her daughter's case and has even searched the desert by herself. A year later, some of April's clothing and suitcase were found in a three-mile area near the Ludlow mine shaft, not far from a bloody mattress. Unfortunately, due to the elements, the clothing had little to offer in terms of evidence and no other signs of her whereabouts have come to light since then. Although no body has ever been found, authorities have still searched several mine shafts within the vicinity, and others investigating the case have done the same. The reason that Gloria believed her daughter may have been murdered was because of her work with authorities on a federal case. April's participation helped send at least one man to prison, and while that man lived in Arkansas, April apparently met his wife when she moved to California. Although we hope that one day April will be found alive, she was declared legally dead in 2012. <laughs>